Okay, thank you. Well, I'm really happy to be doing this today. And it's just fun to see that people are here from all over Washington and actually all over the country. Uh, one of the things that we said last time, still true today, this uh, webinar is going to be a lot better if people ask questions or actually make comments, make suggestions on different ways to do things. And so I want to invite you to do that in the chat box. And Michelle is going to help me watch the chat box. Sometimes I get kind of carried away with the topic and miss questions that come in. Um, and so I, I think it's fine to type in a question anytime it comes to you. I may pause a moment because we're just getting there, but we will get to the question. And there is time. You're not going to disrupt anybody's uh, chance to hear the whole thing by posing a question. And the other thing that um, I I found on this topic is if you are new to some of this, and a lot of us have done parts of it, but not all of it. If you're new to some of this, the first time you look at these slides and hear what I'm gonna say about them, it can be kind of overwhelming. And that's why it's great that Michelle is recording this and has sent the slides. And my suggestion would be um, just expect that you might need to go back and look at these slides again, or listen on the recording according to the explanation of the slide, because um, I'm going to, I really, if I'm going too fast or you are just like, what on earth is she talking about? Please say something that will help me to pause and make sure that everybody is with us. But I also know that some of the things we're going to talk about with these indirect cost rates, it takes a while to think about how that would work in your organization. So with that, I'm going to start moving the slides forward, I hope. And um, we're going to do a poll first thing, just so I get a sense of who's in the group. And if you would just respond with um, your role in sexual assault, uh, that will really help me know a, a little bit about language, about how much I can speak in accountant jargon and how much we should really focus on trying to um, talk about this in a way that makes sense to people who are not accountants. And I really do believe this material is completely understandable by non-accountants. There's no mystery here. Um, so this is helpful. Okay. And I, I just am always tempted when people choose other to say, could you chat in uh, what other roles you might have? And I'll glance at those just to make sure that uh, I'm kidding. Oh, great. We've got a board member. That's wonderful. I, and a finance coordinator, not an accountant. Yeah, there's a difference there. So I'll just keep watching that and I'm going to end the poll. I think I can do that. And uh, looks like we've got a real mix, which is is exactly what I was hoping for. So thank you for attending. And now uh, let's figure out what we're gonna talk about. So the overall theme of this session is how do you recover your administrative and other overhead costs from, fun, from funding sources that include federal dollars. Now, in some cases, awards that don't include, include any federal dollars that are just purely state money also use the same rules as the feds, but we're gonna talk specifically about if you're getting a funding source that has federal dollars in it, what are the rules that you're gonna to have to follow in order to be sure that you can charge your administrative and overhead costs to each award and hopefully get each of your funding agreements to pay their fair share of those costs. Now I have to tell you to start out with that is easier said than done. And so we're going to talk about how can you use these rules to do as much as you can towards that goal, but recognizing that it's a challenging goal. So we are going to talk about cost objectives, which has a very specific meaning in the federal guidelines cost distribution, how do we actually distribute cost among the cost objectives? And probably right there, we're in jargon land. So we're gonna define those terms. 
And then we're going to talk about cost allocation plans, which are, of course, written documents that probably every one of us has. And it's not just what's on paper that matters. What matters is, are we actually following our plan? Are we actually implementing it? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about indirect cost rates, which is a specific methodology that can be used to recover administrative and overhead costs. But not every nonprofit organization that gets federal funds actually uses an indirect cost rate. So a lot of what I'm interested in is how do you evaluate your choices? You have multiple ways that you could recover those costs which way is best for your organization. So that's our goal in this session. And we just have to have a little reminder of the great world of rock, paper, scissors in terms of the compliance framework for um, how this all works. Those of you who were with us last week heard a lot about the uniform guidance and you know that it got revised in 2020. And we also know that you are very familiar with specific federal program regulations. And I would add VOCA to this and a number of the other sexual assault and domestic violence uh, programs. And also we have to follow GAAP accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. Now we've got a hand raised. Um, so I wonder, do we need to do, do we have a question or is it a, a technical problem, Michelle? Can you tell? Hmm. Uh, this person says, I can hear you. That's okay. Great. All right. Oh, great. We've got a CPA who works with nonprofits. That's excellent. She will be very helpful to us in this gap accounting section. Okay, so I think the starting point in understanding all of this is that we really have to be able to figure out what is the full cost of a program. And it's challenging to say, well, what is a program? Because some of us would say, well, you know, I, I'm a sexual assault agency. I have a children's program. I have a program for people in crisis. I have a survivor support group program. And we would define programs by sort of packages of services that are designed to serve a particular population. And often, if we're defining program like that, we're going to be using multiple funding sources to pay for that. Others of us would define a program as being essentially each of our grants. Now, what I have found is that when you're small, that works okay. But as you get larger and you have programs that are more complex and you're using multiple streams of funding to support those programs, you probably move away from that definition of every grant is a separate program. Now we're gonna talk more about that and that's, that's different for different agencies, but regardless of that issue, the whole essence of what we're trying to talk about is what's the full cost of doing a program? Um, and, or you could say, what's the full cost of having a funding award? Well, the answer to that question is, you've got three kinds of costs that you have to add together to get to the full cost. You have what we call direct costs, and those are costs that it is so easy to identify a cost as being associated with a single program that there's no question about it. What's an example of that? Well, maybe you have a children's intervention program and you hire someone who is a child psychologist and they work just in that program the cost of their contract or wages, it's gonna be a direct cost and you can associate it with that children's program. But we all know that we have some costs that are not direct costs of any specific program. And what they are is some kind of shared or common cost. Now, an example of that, when we all used to come to work in a place rather than work from home, an example was where we rented a space for all of our different programs and our managers and our fundraisers. And we were all there in this common space and we had rent and utilities and other costs associated with that. 
Now, those weren't management costs, unless we were talking about the part of the space that people doing agency-wide management were using, but they were not direct costs. They were shared costs that benefited all the different programs that we did. So we have to add a fair share of the shared non-management costs to the direct costs. And then finally, we get to these management costs. And here we're talking about agency-wide management. What's an example of that? Well, we have some CFOs on this call and they are engaged in agency-wide financial management planning and oversight. And so they are an agency-wide management cost. And although sometimes people question this, they actually benefit each program. And so when we talk about allocating management costs, we're talking out about figuring out what's the fair share of management costs that should be charged to each of our programs. And when we add those three elements together, we get to the full cost of doing that program. And so the challenge that we're interested in in this session is how can we document and follow the guidance so that we come as close as possible to getting a funder to pay for the full cost of a service that they say they want to fund us to provide. So it really does matter um, because every time we take on a new funding source, really whether it's a foundation grant or a direct federal award or federal funds that are coming through the state, every time we take on a funding source, we have to answer the question, is this source going to pay the full cost of doing what they say we're supposed to do, they say they want to fund? And the other reason why I think it's really interesting in sexual assault is that in VOCA, we do have provisions for some program income. Different states are dealing with this program income question differently, and I'm not going to go into a lot of discussion about it. But if you are either dealing with a funding source or in a state where you are able to recover some program income charge for some of your services, but you're also using some of your federal funds to pay a portion of the cost of those services, you're going to have to become expert on program income requirements. And the just core expertise you need is to understand what the full cost of each service is. Now, the part of the matter here is that within the federal funding regulations, they have provided four different ways that nonprofit recipients or subrecipients can charge their administrative and other indirect or shared costs. Now, just to get the language straight, when we say somebody is a recipient, that means they have a direct federal award from a federal agency. And when we say they're a subrecipient, it means that they're getting their federal funds through a pass-through entity like a state. Now, the same rules are going to apply, whether you're a recipient or a subrecipient. You've got these four ways to be allowed to charge your funding source for your agency-wide administrative or management costs and your other common costs. Now, it turns out that three of these, I'm going to try to activate my pen and my light, three of these methods are indirect cost rates. One of them is not an indirect cost rate. And what is that all about? Well, it means that in these three methods, you are going to translate information about your direct costs and your costs that are not direct costs. You're going to translate it into a percentage and you're going to be allowed to charge your awards that include federal funds that percentage but it's a little trickier than that it's not 10 percent of the whole award for example so in each of these methods we have to learn about how you calculate that rate 
What's different in the green box in the direct charging of allocated costs is we're not going to call anything an indirect cost. We're going to allocate all of our costs, including, remember that CFO who is an administrative cost, an agency-wide management cost, we're going to allocate a portion of the cost of that position. And then when we report it, we're going to report it as a direct cost. And it's kind of mind-numbing to think about that, that, well, it's an allocated cost. Now you want me to call it a direct cost, but that's just how this method works. And we're going to illustrate that. Okay, the starting point is understanding a concept that was in the old uniform guidance. It survived, it came into the revised. Okay, we're gonna guidance. pause for an interpreter switch. Oh, great, okay. Maybe pause for a deep breath too. Um, okay, great, there we go. Um, so it's essential to understand this concept of cost objective. This is from the uniform guidance and you can read the definition there on the screen. But the interesting thing to me is that it gives you, the nonprofit organization, the choice of how you want to define cost objective. And you could define it as a program or a function or an activity or an award or a division of your organization, you get to make that choice. And it is an important choice because for certain kinds of funding, the choice you make can make it easier or harder to recover the full cost. And we're gonna look at some examples of that. So whichever way you have chosen to define cost objective, um, the starting point is documenting your direct costs. And this is really the easy stuff, right? You know, you're buying things, you're paying for things. Well, you got to be sure that it was necessary. It wasn't a prohibited expense for federal funds like alcohol is almost always a prohibited expense. And you have to be able to associate that cost directly with the cost objective. And here I said program objective because I do like to use program as the objective. But if you chose award as your cost objective, you would say, I'm going to associate that cost directly with the award objective. And then I have to have proof that the cost was incurred and that whatever we paid for, we got what we paid for. So those are the simple things in this. Where it gets harder is when we have certain costs that benefit more than one cost objective. And of course, there we come back to you got to define what you mean by cost objective. You have to be consistent with your definition of what is a cost objective. And then the general rule is once you have your structure of cost objectives, you've laid them all out on a spreadsheet, you have to come up with a method to allocate the costs that benefit more than one objective fairly to all the cost objectives. So now we're looking at an example of what's called the functional cost objective, meaning that you know, obviously it has line items, we all have line items, but I've distinguished a cost center for management, one for fundraising. In this example, I've got an early childhood program. We've got that children's program for children dealing with the impact of sexual assault. Maybe we're running an emergency shelter. Um, maybe we've got a senior program. Whatever the components of your program are, whatever your cost objectives are, these are functional, meaning what is the purpose of spending money. If I'm spending money on that child psychologist, the purpose is to help our children's program. So that's what a functional uh, cost objective structure looks like. On the other hand, if we're using a funding agreement as our cost objective, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to have all our different awards, and then we probably have a category that is unrestricted. It's things we're going to pay for without any specific award. And the larger and more complex the organization gets, the more likely it is that this unrestricted column is actually like six, 10, or 20 different 
other sources that are not governmental awards. Um, and so they may not follow the governmental rules. And we've just summarized them here to make it fit on a screen. But you may have multiple cost objectives. In fact, a lot of organizations will be using 15, 20. Uh, if they're using awards, sometimes I see it go up to 60. And that can make it really challenging. That's one of the reasons why I prefer to use program as the cost objective, but more on that later. So let's go back to this concept of shared or common cost. And one of the problems in this topic is that we toss around a term called indirect cost. Remember, we've talked about indirect cost rates. And the problem is not everybody has the same meaning for that term indirect cost. So rather than argue about the meaning, I think it's helpful to say, let's describe the kind of cost we're talking about. And we are talking about costs that benefit multiple cost objectives. And I gave that example of rent in a facility. Another one would be if you have a common computer system that serves all of your programs, plus your fundraising, plus your overall management and accounting, well, that's going to be a common cost, okay? So we are going to figure out a way to fairly allocate those common costs. Now, in this category of common cost or shared cost, you could say, well, doesn't that include my agency-wide management costs? Isn't that an example of a cost that benefits all the cost objectives? Yes, it is an example of that. And yes, it is a type of common cost. The reason why I break it out separately and talk about it differently from this concept of common cost is that many federal funding awards come with specific limitations on administrative costs. They are not limitations on allocating your uh, rent costs or allocating uh, your other common costs. They are administrative cost limitations. So, And also, if you think back to gap accounting, think about your audited financial statements. Think about the 990. Remember that in general, we have an expectation that nonprofits can distinguish their administrative or management costs from their program costs and from their fundraising costs. Now, the common thing about both these agency-wide administrative costs and the other shared or common costs is that it's impossible to track the exact benefit provided to each program or function or award. You would drive yourself nuts trying to do it. It would not be cost effective and the feds do not want you to do that. They want you to use an estimation method that is efficient and fair. And that's what all the rest of what we're gonna talk about is, is about. So um, what do the feds have to say about this concept of allocating costs fairly? Well, whatever method you choose, it has to be reasonable. It has to make some sense to a, you know, just an average person like, oh, that seems fair. And it has to be cost effective. It cannot be overly burdensome to use this method. And you can use different approaches, different methods for different types of costs there's an exception there, unless you decide to use the indirect cost rate method, in which case there are some limits on your ability to use different approaches. Whatever approaches you choose, you've got to be consistent in treating similar types of costs similarly. You can't say, well, you know, I like this method here and that method there, not by the type of cost, but just by the type of funder that I have. Well, they, they're not so generous here on rent, so I'm going to use a different method for them. That would be unfair. And fairness is a big part of this whole thing. So if you remember that chart that we looked at that had the one box for direct charging cost allocation, and then it had three boxes for different indirect rate methods, we're talking about that direct charging, the one box. And this is just a very simplified example of what direct charging looks like. So let's kind of walk through this example together and um, See if I can point to what I want. What I did here is I laid out three programs and then a shared cost center. 
And the first thing I did was figure out what were the direct costs of each of those three programs. And then these are all shared costs that rent and audit. An audit is an administrative cost, but it's part of shared cost. If we have a facility and we pay people to maintain it and it's benefiting all of our programs, that's a shared cost, utilities. I totaled up all those shared costs. And then I had to figure out how am I going to share them out among these three programs, because my goal is to figure out the full cost of each of those three programs. So what did I do? Well, I came up with an allocation method to allocate the rent and the audit and the maintenance and the utilities. And I made this shared cost column go to zero because I allocated all those costs out. And now those costs appear in the total cost of each program. And if I were asked to submit a report on the cost of program three, I would show them all the direct costs that I identified, plus the fair share of these shared costs. That's how I would do it in a cost allocation uh, direct charging method. Now, one of the things we struggle with is um, how to define and recover administrative or management costs. And it's really important to grasp that you can get them several different ways. You can get to charge them several different ways. You can use direct charging through a cost allocation plan, or you can use an indirect cost rate, but you're gonna get those admin costs. So what are they? What are we talking about? Well, we're generally talking about the cost to manage the whole operation. And so that includes the cost of supporting the board. If the executive director, for example, spends time recruiting and working with board members, maybe we have an executive assistant who coordinates all the board meetings and board materials. Those are board support costs. Financial management, the whole financial management function. We've got the CFO, we've got accountants, we've got accounting clerks, we're processing all of our transactions, we're maintaining the general ledger, we're preparing budgets, the whole financial management function for the agency. And then I've got HR and IT here, and I want to be clear that I am not talking about, oh, this person, you know, filled out some paperwork in for someone to get on the payroll. We're talking about high level management functions here. Um, so the person who plans and works out the employment policies and um, manages all the HR systems and the same thing with IT management. I'm not talking about anybody who touches a computer. That would be everybody. Um, I'm talking about the person who does the planning and the actual overall management of our technology. So those are all examples of core management functions. And you'll notice I described them in terms of what kind of work was being done, not necessarily by the name of the position. For example, a very common mistake is to say, well, I have an executive director, they must all be admin. And um, occasionally I find a nonprofit where that's true, but what is much more common is that the executive director does some admin and management functions, but they also do some fundraising functions. And in smaller organizations, they often do some programmatic work. They are, they are subject matter experts, and they are actually directing and working with and coaching people on the delivery of the services. So um, you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge by the title of a job. You have to look at what the person is doing. Okay, so one of the things that is just kind of mind twisting in this world is that admin costs can either be direct costs or indirect costs. Now, how can that be? Well, most management costs, agency-wide management, they are going to be a type of indirect cost because they benefit everything. But occasionally I will see in a specific program or associated with a specific award, 
that there is so much financial work that has to be done that we actually, actually uh, in this period where a lot of us have had big emergency assistance fundings, sometimes we have an accounting clerk who has done nothing but process the payments for emergency assistance. In that example, that's still gonna be an administrative cost, but it may be a cost that only benefits one cost objective that award. So we're not going to say it benefits the whole agency. So this we will come back to this because this is such a frustrating topic. Um, okay, so you know, once you find some of those direct or limited number of programs that have an administrative cost, you can treat them as direct costs or share them between just the two objectives that benefit. But it's much more common that we will say, well, all those fiscal people and all that work supporting the board, all of that is gonna be part of our agency-wide management. We're gonna to have to follow the rules for administrative costs. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. And just to summarize what we've just been saying, um, in the federal system, we got two kinds of costs. We got direct costs, we got indirect costs. What can you say about a direct cost? Well, it's readily identifiable and you can directly assign it because you can see the direct relationship. What are we talking about an indirect cost? Well, it could be our agency-wide administration, but there are other costs that provide benefit for a common or joint purpose. And those are the ones that we're going to have to figure out. How do we do allocation in an acceptable way so that we can charge portions of those costs to our different awards? Okay, now we're kind of turning back. And uh, my interpreters have reminded me that as we start looking at a series of charts, it's probably a good idea to look at the chart and take a deep breath before <laughs> digging in. Now, this is a simple one, but we're going to go to some charts that have a lot of information. And I am going to suggest that we just kind of pause before we dig into what are we talking about. Okay, so this is just a reminder that we got these four different ways to recover management or indirect costs. We just talked a little bit about direct charging. Now we're going to begin talking about these indirect cost rates. And among them, we're going to be talking about the 10% de minimis rate, which you are permitted to use um, without anybody's permission, just you decide you're going to use it. The problem is you got to use it consistently and you got to use it following a set of rules. And so it's not as easy as it looks. Another kind of indirect cost rate that we're going to talk about is one that you negotiate directly with a federal agency. So if you have a direct award, maybe through SAMHSA or maybe um, through the Department of Justice, Federal Department of Justice, you could negotiate a federal indirect cost rate. But a lot of us don't have any direct federal awards. We get all our federal money through pass-through entities, often the state government. And the, the issue, the kind of news since 2020 is clarification that there are some good ways for pass-through entities to negotiate indirect cost rates with their nonprofit subrecipients. So this may be a new wrinkle for you to think about. I thought it would help to just do a comparison between these two approaches, just to be sure we're all on the same page here. So if you're using direct charging or cost allocation, it means that you have a cost allocation plan that explains how you're going to allocate all the different types of costs that have to be allocated. Maybe it's rent, maybe it's telephone, maybe it's computer support, um, maybe it's transportation, uh, maybe it's your accounting system. So you have a plan that says how to allocate each of those costs you can use different methodology. So you may say, well, uh, the way I'm gonna allocate my accounting costs 
is I've had an auditor tell me I should get a transaction counter in my accounting software and I should figure out what percentage of all transactions were charged to a cost center. I have to say that's one of my least favorite methods, but it is a common method. So you might do that, but that method's not going to work to allocate your rent or your telephone cost. So you would use a different method for those. You have to be able to justify the method that you use. You have to write them down in a cost, alloc cost allocation plan and then approve that and put a date on it. And then you have to follow that cost allocation plan. You have to do what it says. So that's what direct charging is all about. In contrast, an indirect cost rate starts with distinguishing direct from indirect costs and then it computes a percentage of a base of direct costs. This is where it gets complicated because there are multiple different kinds of bases that you might choose to use. But once you've chosen one, you have to stick with it at least until you start a new year and negotiate a new rate. And once you've chosen that base and computed the percentage, then you're going to apply that percentage to the base. Let's imagine that I chose the modified total direct cost base, and we'll look at what's in that. And just, let's just say for the sake of argument that in a cost center, I had $100,000 in modified total direct cost in the base. And if I were using the 10% de minimis rate, I would say, okay, 10% times $100,000, that's $10,000. That's how much indirect cost I can charge to this base. Now, the key in that whole idea is knowing what goes in the base and what doesn't go in the base, because it's not everything. So when we're doing that kind of methodology, that's an indirect cost rate. You can declare for yourself, we're going to use the 10% de minimis, and that's it. You just have to follow the rules. Or if you want to negotiate a rate, you're going to have to negotiate with someone. So either your federal funding agency, or if you can get a pass-through agency to negotiate with you, you may decide you want to do that. So um, the direct charging through cost allocation that we talked about has some problems or challenges. So I just want to acknowledge that. First of all, you have to find a defensible allocation method. And if you are in a situation where you keep getting new funding in the middle of your fiscal year or other grants end, uh, if you're in, a, in what I would call a state of flux, or some of your funders add funds to an award in the middle of the year, or they take funds away from that award, you're going to have to keep redoing your allocation because your allocation is based on the configuration of all your programs and all your awards. So, you know, if at the beginning of the year, program number one actually was, um, you figured out it consumed 25% of all your personnel, FTE. And so you base some allocations on 25%. You said, well, they use up 25% of all our staff. I'm going to give them 25% of this allocated cost. Well, suppose you get a big new grant in the middle of the year and program number one is no longer 25% of your FTE. It's dropped down to 15%. Well, now we're going to have to shift the allocation plan. And it's kind of hard to keep up if things are going fast. And for some people, another challenge is, why are you telling me that allocated costs should be reported as direct? It just doesn't seem logical, but it is the way it is. And um, there's another little twist that uh, under the uniform guidance, there are certain costs that can't be charged through cost allocation. You have to get them into an indirect rate. For example, the preparation of grant applications is one of those costs. You can charge it if you have an indirect rate. You can't charge it if you don't. And I see a question that has come through, um, and I think I'll pause and answer this question. Um, it's Tricia, and she's saying, if you have an indirect cost rate, should you be billing that rate with each invoice submitted to your funder? Um, 
I would say from the viewpoint of the nonprofit organization, I could do that. I'm entitled to do that because I have an approved rate, but I would be cautious about doing it because what I would prefer to do is maintain a calculation that will tell me what my actual indirect cost rate is using the method that was approved in my negotiated rate. Because sometimes if you're in a year with huge change where your budget just grew dramatically or it shrank dramatically, your approved rate is not gonna be your actual rate. And if it turns out that your approved rate is higher, you don't wanna have been billing for something that you won't be able to substantiate at the end. So you would never bill for a rate higher than your approved rate, but you might bill for a rate lower than your rate. Um, and I think that's why you're getting some you know, some pushback from the auditors. And we're going to say a little bit more about that when we understand how these rates are, uh, are actually negotiated and what's in, what's out. Okay, she's, I've got a question from Christine saying, can you charge the cost of writing grant applications if it's not competitive? I would say yes. I think that is an administrative cost. That's the typical interpretation. Um, you've been, you're, you're already being funded. Now we're going to get next year's uh, funding and they say you've got to write a narrative for what you're going to do. That's going to be treated as a management cost. Okay, I'm going to keep going and maybe I'll come back to some more questions in a minute and then I think I'm probably just going to create more questions. Okay, there are some common cost allocation mistakes that we should be aware of. Um, and one of the most common mistakes is saying, well, I know how much uh, accounting I can charge here. I know how much telephone I can charge. I'm gonna charge what the funder put in the budget and whatever they're willing to pay for. So if I've got a funder who says, you know, hey, we're sports, we're gonna give you 2% admin, I'll just charge them 2%. You cannot do that. You are violating the federal rules if you do that. The essence of the federal rule is fairness. So if you are gonna charge 10%, you're gonna use the 10% de minimis rate, you have to charge it to every cost objective, including the one that says, oh, no, 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 you know, we, we don't do that. Uh, it's often it's a foundation, a big foundation funding award that they say, we don't pay indirect costs, you're out of your mind. Um, and so you can't say, all right, we'll skip you. No, you have to charge 10% to every cost objective. And then you have to find an unrestricted source that will make up the difference. Um, maybe you do big fundraising events and you can, you know, I probably wouldn't use this as the pitch, help us cover our unfunded admin costs because some of our funders refuse to do it. That's probably not a good funding appeal, but that's really what you're doing, okay? Another uh, common mistake is just failing to allocate a cost to all the cost objectives that benefit from it. And that's sort of more of the same, that we're thinking, well, I, I can't, I don't have room in this grant to give them a share of this cost. So I'll just skip that cost objective, that program or that grant. That really is violating the federal rules. Okay. Now we're ready to launch into the actual calculation of the indirect cost rates. And this is, this is sort of like the, um, the warning, you know, the, the, this may be disturbing to some listeners. Okay, for some of us ever thinking about fractions again after we left school is very disturbing, um, but we are gonna have to think about fractions because this whole concept of indirect cost is based on figuring out a numerator, which is the top part of the fraction as the indirect cost and a denominator, which is the bottom part of the fraction. And you probably remember, or maybe you've tried to forget that the way you turn a fraction into a percentage is you divide the numerator by the denominator. And so I'm gonna, and it looks like we're about to change interpreters. This is, might be kind of a good time. So um, here's the thing. Do you remember fractions? She's ready to go. 
And some of us do remember them, believe it or not, some of us remember them with pleasure. We like that. Others remember it with just horror that that's when math became very unfriendly. But the key thing to drag out of your memory is that the numerator is the top of the fraction and the denominator is the bottom. And if we want to turn a fraction into a percentage, we divide the numerator by the denominator. And these will be the familiar examples that you probably remember that, you know, okay, if I have a one in the numerator and a four in the denominator, that's going to be 25%. If I have one in the numerator and two in the denominator, that's 50%. That's what we're doing in an indirect cost rate calculation. So to do this calculation, you've got to define what you're going to put in the numerator in the indirect cost pool. And then in a minute, we're going to define what to put in the denominator. Now, we have choices about what to put in the numerator. And we could put all of the costs that we would characterize as being shared or common, as well as the administrative costs or we could just put the agency-wide management or administrative costs. We decide how we wanna do it. Now, when we're negotiating a rate, we do have some federal funders that have a very strong preference for one of these two approaches. So you may have to give in and do what they would prefer, but it's certainly worthwhile to test whether this is gonna work better for you to just put the management costs in or to put the management costs plus the other common costs into the numerator of the fraction. And by doing that, you're going to start speaking of them as your indirect costs. And the whole point of negotiating this rate is once you have it, you're going to use that rate to be able to charge these indirect costs to your various awards. So um, you can only put allowable costs into the numerator. So, uh, you know, I actually encountered and worked with an organization that had a standing practice. They found the attendance at their board meetings improved dramatically if they always served alcohol at all board meetings. So they had an open bar at every board meeting. Now, not surprisingly, that was kind of expensive, right? Alcohol is expensive. And remember that the cost of supporting your board is by definition an administrative cost. And so it's going to be in that indirect cost numerator. But one of the pieces of bad news I had to give them was that alcohol is an unallowable cost for federal purposes. So you can't put that in the numerator. The feds are not going to pay for alcohol, even if you're slipping it into your indirect cost rate. So that's a little bit about the numerator. Now we're going to talk about the denominator or the bottom of the fraction. What is your direct cost base? And let's say as a starting point, it is not the total cost of the program. It is not the total amount of the award. It's one of several different numbers that you get to choose which you think would be a better base. So if you decided you wanted to use the de minimis rate, the 10% rate, you must use it following the rules for the modified total direct cost base. And we're going to go over those rules. If you're going to be able to negotiate your own indirect cost rates, you're going to you know, negotiate either with the feds or with a pass-through entity. You have a choice of three different kinds of bases. You could use the modified total direct cost base, um, same one that is used in the de minimis rate. You could use a base called direct salaries and wages, which is exactly what it sounds like. Or you could use total personnel costs where you take those direct salaries and wages and you add taxes and benefits, employer taxes and benefits. So again, we're always talking about direct costs here. So we, if, you know, if you go back to my example of I've got a children's program in my sexual assault organization and I hire some um, 
people who are experts in working with young children, that's a direct cost. So their salaries and wages would be in the total direct salaries and wages base. Or if I'm using the total personnel cost base, I would add the employer taxes and benefits associated with their position. Okay. So the way we're going to do this calculation is we're going to put the allowable indirect costs in the numerator, the direct cost base, whichever one we chose in the denominator, we're going to divide and we're going to get an indirect cost rate. And let's talk about that de minimis rate first. Um, and this is the one that you're entitled to just say we're using it and no one can really dispute you on that. And you know, when they first came out with the uniform guidance, there was a limitation that if you had previously had a federally negotiated rate, you couldn't use it. That limitation was eliminated in the revisions in 2020. Don't have to negotiate, but you do have to do the calculation right. And so that's what we're gonna work on next is doing the calculation right. Okay, so the numerator is going to be your total indirect costs, however you define them. The denominator is going to be this thing called the modified total direct costs. And then we're going to get this rate and apply it to each cost center. So in this example where we said we're going to use the 10% rate, we already know the answer that is allowable. It's 10%. Now we're going to see in another example that the problem with this 10% rate is that for some of us, our actual rate using the modified total direct cost method is much higher than 10%. So if we elect to use the 10% rate, we're just not going to collect some of our indirect costs because we accepted the 10% rate. Okay, the whole catch here is what is in the modified total direct cost base. Um, and that, you know, you got to think about it. What does modified mean? It means that we made some change to the whole. We modified it in some way. And so uh, it's not our total direct cost. Those might include some unallowable costs. So they can't be in there. So I think it's easier to visualize this with a chart. And I just want to pause a moment while we take our first look at this chart. So this is a chart that is illustrating that in a, my example, I have three programs, program one, two, and three that are funded, including federal dollars. And then I have a cost center where I've pushed together all my programs that are funded by some other kind of source, not federal sources. Okay, and the first challenge here is I wanna figure out which costs go into the modified total direct cost calculation. So I have to understand which direct costs I can put into this chart and which ones I can't put into the chart. But one thing is already clear that because I've chosen that 10% de minimis rate, if I conclude that I have $4 million in modified total direct cost and I multiply it by 10%, 400,000 is the most that I can recover for indirect costs um, because that's 10% of my modified total direct cost base. Now let's, uh, this chart just got more complicated. So let's take a moment to kind of think about this chart. Um, what I've done here in the white section, let me get my pointer, the white section over here, is I've recognized that not all our costs are in this modified total direct cost base. There's $4 million there, but we have some other costs to think about. Well, one category is allowable direct cost. And since I'm using the 10% rate, I already know the answer to that question. It's $400,000. Let's say this is one of those organizations that serves alcohol to the board. So it's got unallowable indirect cost. I've got to separate those out. And then I come to the really tough area, which is excluded direct cost. Now, the thing about these excluded costs is they're not unallowable. 
they are allowable costs. We are gonna be able to charge them to our various awards, but they are excluded because we had to modify the direct cost base. Now in our next slide, we're looking at what gets excluded from the modified total direct cost base. And we'll start with equipment. We can't put that in the base. We can't put rental costs in the base. These participant support costs is a very specific definition. It's primarily applicable to programs that are like sending participants through training and maybe they need to buy them steel toed boots. It's pretty narrow. Um, we're not in healthcare, so I'm not going to talk about charges for patient care. Uh, can't put any tuition remission programs, but the one that really catches a lot of us is this one. If your organization is passing money through to other nonprofits, if you're functioning as a pass through entity and you're making sub awards to these other entities, you can only put the first $25,000 in each award in the modified total direct cost base. The remainder, any amount over 25,000 in one of these sub awards has to be excluded. And the other exclusion is other costs that would distort the distribution of indirect costs. Now that's kind of vague, right? I, and I'm afraid the test is kind of, you'll know them when you see them. Uh, these are typically very large costs that don't make much demand on your indirect cost functions. Um, and sometimes people will say, well, what about, you know, we suddenly got all this money to give rent assistance and it was like a million dollars that we gave out and it really didn't function like our ordinary pro spending a million dollars in a program would involve hiring a lot of staff, supervising them, a lot of payroll and benefits work. So we might say that was an other cost that if we put it in the modified direct cost base would distort the answer. Okay, now not everybody has those costs, so it may not be a problem. Here comes a chart that it takes a minute to really uh, sort of take in and think about. Um, okay, so in this chart, we're looking at the 10% modified total direct cost rate. It starts out looking like the other chart we looked at. It's got the three programs and the non-federal cost center. We put the direct costs that are allowed in the modified direct cost category that came out with $4 million, just like we saw before. But what's new here is we're gonna talk about this exclusion of $40,000. And remember that one of those excluding rules was that we were going to exclude um, amounts of sub awards above $25,000. Well, this organization had a $65,000 sub award that it made. So it had to exclude that from the base, but you'll see it adds it back into what it can charge for program three, because that's where that, that award was from. So they add it back. Now, the other thing to get from looking at this chart is that um, the way we apply the 10% rate is we multiply 10% times the modified total direct costs in each program, including in our non-federal programs. And so when I look at my non-federal programs, I've got the $200,000 in direct cost. I've got $20,000 in the 10% um, de minimis rate. And then I got to pick up the alcohol here for a grand total of $230,000. And I need to be able to show that I have that $230,000 to cover that cost. Okay. Um, and I see a question that I can answer quickly before I go on to another mind numbing uh, chart, which is, um, it was mentioned that uh, the direct cost allocation plan needs to be documented and approved each time it's changed. Does this mean the board needs to approve any change? It depends on your fiscal policies. If you have said the board is going to approve the plan, then yeah, they should approve the amendment. If you said that the executive director has the authority to approve the plan in the middle of the year, then that's it. Okay, 
what about the just we're done with the 10 percent de minimis that was like a given we know uh we know what to do about that and we know how we're going to apply that if we're using it now um in order to negotiate with the feds you do have to have a direct federal award you submit a proposal and they negotiate with you um these are all the steps i'm going to go through this kind of fast because I know we want to get to the actual nuts and bolts of this. Um, so if you're thinking about doing it, there's a lot of good guidance online and I've given you some links for how to prepare this proposal. So you got to make these choices. Uh, you got to decide whether in your numerator you're putting management only or management and all your common costs and you've got to choose among the three bases. And, uh, you know, there's one choice and here we go with the denominator choices. I think it's uh, kind of easier to understand these choices by looking at examples, but there are some rules that apply on all the choices. You've got to have, we're going to be producing a spreadsheet that illustrates how you do these uh, allocations and calculations. You got to put all of your programs into the spreadsheet. You can't just put the federally funded ones. You've got to include all direct costs um, that are unallowable for federal funds. You just can't put them in the federal award columns. You have to put them in the non-federal award columns. And if you're gonna use the modified total direct cost method, you've gotta be ready to exclude those direct costs like we just saw. Okay, so um, this example that I'm showing now, and we're just gonna pause and look at it because it, it's kind of overwhelming to to look at this chart to begin with. But once you become familiar with the format, I think these charts are gonna get less overwhelming. In this example, we're using that direct salaries method. That is the base is just gonna be the salaries. It's not gonna include the employer taxes or fringe benefits. It's not gonna include any non-salary costs. And so what we do is we go through each of our three awards and then the stuff we're gonna pay for with non-federal money. And we figure out, well, what are the direct salaries gonna be in each of those awards? And the total we came up with was 2.2 .2 million. And we also figured out what all of our allowable indirect cost salaries would be because salaries are a big part of indirect costs, all those fiscal people part of the executive director. So we figured that out. And then we remembered that indirect costs includes more than salaries. For one thing, it's going to include the employer tax and fringe benefits, but it's also going to include all the non personnel indirect costs. So we're going to total that all up. And in this example, it came to $800,000 in allowable indirect costs. And we're going to take that $800,000 in allowable indirect costs, and we're going to divide it by just the direct salaries not by the total direct costs, by the direct salaries. And the answer we're going to get is a 36% indirect cost rate. Now, once we've gotten there, we want to see, well, what's that going to look like when I actually use that rate? And here's what it's going to look like. We go back to saying, well, here are the direct salaries in each of those awards and in the non-federal category. We apply the rate, the 36% rate. We, reply, we multiply 36% times the direct salaries. Then we add in the other direct expenses, and this is the total amount that we can charge that award. So the use of the indirect rate is to calculate how much indirect we can charge to each award. But we always have to keep in mind that we have to assign that same rate to our non-federally funded programs and we have to have a source of funds to pay that. Okay, and I'm going to keep going. I'm going to answer a couple questions at the end, I think, because I am starting to get a little worried that we need to go through these three examples and then we'll come back and do some questions on them. So I wanted this, this chart is using the second method, the direct personnel cost. Remember, that's where we add the employer taxes and benefits. 
So it's not surprising that we come up with a higher base number, right? If the other one was just salaries and this has employer taxes and benefits, this is going to be a bigger number. And um, we're going to, this is also going to be a bigger number here in the salaries and fringe benefits for the people in the indirect cost category. But our indirect costs are actually still going to be $800,000. That's just what they were. What's different here is that we're going to take that $800,000 in allowable indirect costs and we're going to divide it by the total salary and fringe costs. That's $3 million. And the answer we're going to get is a 27% indirect cost rate. Now, if you just think about it, it's not surprising it's a lower percentage because we had a bigger denominator. They, they, when we added those taxes and benefits, the, the denominator got bigger. Now, how does it look when we apply that 27% rate? Well, let's just look at this chart for a minute. And the, I'd say the business end of this chart is that this time, because the rate is 27%, we're going to multiply the total direct personnel costs by 27% to see how much indirect cost we can charge to each award. And the same thing is true here. We've got the non-federal programs. We've got to charge them at the 27% rate, even though a lot of their funders are going to say, absolutely, no, we do not pay 27% indirect cost. You're going to have to find other sources of funds so that you can cover the full cost of those non-federal programs. I got one more of these examples. Um, which is, it's the modified total direct cost method again. Why are we talking about it again? Well, because many organizations find when they do this calculation that the answer is not 10%, okay? That when they figure out what are the modified direct costs that we can put in the base, okay? It really, in this example, added up to $3.6 million. And then they figured out the allowable indirect cost, $800,000. And they discovered that the actual modified total direct cost rate would be 22%. So if they had accepted 10%, they really would have made a serious mistake here. Um, okay, so how does it look when we apply these to the uh, modified total direct cost base? Well, this chart, is kind of like the others in that we say, okay, I know it's a 22% rate. I'm going to multiply the modified total direct cost in each award. In award one here, I'm going to multiply it by 22%. I'm going to assign 22% to the non-federal direct cost center. And I'm going to have to show that I've got the money to cover those non-federal costs. And so that's how we would use this base. So, you know, in summary here, three different bases, you get three different indirect cost rates. And it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a mistake that people make to think, oh, that organization with a 36% indirect cost rate, they must be just so greedy and so uninterested in serving people. They just want to waste all the money on indirect costs. And what you can see from these examples is that that's just not true. It's just a different method that will allow each of these organizations, the one with the 36% rate, the 27% or the 22% rate to recover all of their indirect costs. Um, and I, the choice of which method to use um, is up to you. I have to say a lot of people choose the direct salaries and wages base because of simplicity. They run a payroll. They always know what their payroll is. They can always do this computation. Um, they, someone will say, well, I've got just as good a record every month of the total direct personnel counts. We figure out the employer taxes and the benefits every month. I have that number ready to go. I could use that. 
Um, and others will say, well, it's a little more complicated to use the modified total direct cost base, but I've got so many funders that object to high indirect rates. I just don't want to talk to somebody about why a 36% rate isn't an example of how greedy and uncaring we are. So I would just rather not talk about it. Um, so that's, that's it. Now, I think I should pause here because I'm about to start talking about negotiating with a pass through entity and I want to get some of these questions. Um, and so I'm going to, sorry, Ben, I think I'm going to start from the bottom because it'll be easier for me to read them. Um, so we have, uh, is it possible for two federal grants for the same period to have different indirect rates? It, yes. Uh, that's a complication that will have happened because when you negotiated the budget for the first one, you were using one rate and most of us are involved in a piece of the system that is called provisional and final rates. And so the, for those of us, other than the largest institutions, we propose a rate the federal negotiator agrees that that can be our provisional rate for a specified time period. And then we're required to submit information after we have our independent audit that would document what our actual rate was using the same methodology. And sometimes our actual rate is lower sometimes our actual rate is higher. And if it turned out our actual rate is higher, when we negotiate the next rate with our negotiator, we're going to say, look at these numbers. You know, we had a 22% rate last year, but it needs to be 24% for this year. And so that will be approved as our provisional rate. But if we had an application that we had and a budget that we had negotiated with that earlier rate, it probably does show that earlier rate. Now, there are some things you may be able to do to bring those two rates into congruence, but it's complicated. And it's, it's problematic if you don't because of the consistency principle. The basic ideas that the feds want to work with is you charge the same to all awards. So that's what you're really after. And so I think it would be worth trying to work with the first funder to get the current rate allowed to be used. But I know that some have had pushback on that. Um, and I think I see under Tara for the yellow and purple chart, is it correct to say my organization is using a modified total direct cost rate and using the 10% de minimis as the base? No, the way you would describe it is um, that you, when you're speaking about using the 10% de minimis, you say we are using the 10% de minimis rate. Uh, and if asked a question, that is 10% of our modified total direct cost base. That's how we describe that. If we had a, if we had negotiated a modified total direct cost based rate that was not the de minimis, we would say, I have a negotiated indirect cost rate using the modified total direct cost method and my rate for this year is 22%. Now, I, I like this question, what if our indirect cost rate is less than the 10% we have applied for? Now, I'm not sure if that question means actually applied for or we declared we were using the 10% rate. If you declared you were using the 10% rate, this is not a problem that your actual rate is lower than 10%. One of the kind of weird rules in this is you don't have to prove that you had 10% indirect costs. So you're free to just charge it. But if you actually, I don't think anybody would negotiate an indirect rate under 10%. They would just say, I'll take the 10% de minimis and skip the negotiation. Um, and let's see if there's anything else I should try and catch before we go on to these pass through entities. I think that was the last one. I think that's the last one. Okay, now this is actually some news um, that when the indirect guidance first came out, um, 
it said something about, well, you could negotiate with a pass-through entity, but it wasn't very clear how that would work. And the revised uniform guidance does clarify how it works. And we talked a lot about that last time. And so I would just say, take a look at those slides. And the whole thing is um, the revised uniform guidance says that you, the subrecipient, and your pass-through entity are to collaborate on the determination of an indirect cost rate. Now that sort of implies that you're gonna cooperate with each other. And this is a, I'm, I'm sort of like hesitating because not all pass-through entities want to negotiate indirect cost rates with their subrecipients. I think it's worth bringing it up if you would like to do it. And the kind of neat thing that got clarified in the revised Uniform Grants Guidance was that if you do succeed in getting one pass-through entity to negotiate a rate with you, all your other pass-through entities have to accept it. So it might really be worth doing. So this really brings us to kind of the goal here of this session, which is what's best for your organization. Um, and uh, let's just see, well, what are people doing now? Can we run this poll, Michelle? And, uh, I'm looking at, are you just doing direct charging, no indirect cost rate? Are you doing the 10% de minimis? Um, are, did you negotiate a rate? And which base did you use? Um, are you not sure what you're doing? Um, which would not be unusual. Um, okay, the numbers are coming in. Okay. All right, I think we might have everybody in. Oh, some people are changing their minds. Okay. You can see that um, we're the largest group, and this has been pretty consistent in sexual assault, in my experience, um, is doing direct charging. And a lot of times that's because before the uniform guidance, um, a lot of us didn't have any direct federal relationships, so we couldn't negotiate an indirect cost rate. So we learned how to do this cost allocation method. Um, we see a growing number that are using the 10%. Uh, I always worry whether that is actually uh, working for them, but it might be. It, it, there, there are situations where that could work. And then we're also seeing, this, this is interesting to me, that among, it's a small group, but among those who have negotiated rates, the most popular method seems to be the modified total direct cost. In um, other types of organizations that I work with, actually that um, direct salaries base is more popular. So I'm, I'm interested in that. And one of the things I think uh, I just, kind of suggest is if you'd like to learn more about how others are thinking about it, uh, you know, there's this new tool that's supposed to go up soon that um, the feds are going to publish the indirect cost rates that have been negotiated. So you can see more about how other organizations like yours are using um, indirect costs and what base they're using, or it might be possible to just do some exchange with each other. Okay, I think we've seen enough of that. That was really helpful to me. Um, and now, you know, you got to make a decision. How are you going to do this? Do you want to make any change? Or are you just going to leave things as they are? And um, I, I guess when I've tried to make this decision for a nonprofit organization, here's what I've thought about. How much direct federal funding do we have? Um, how much of our total budget comes from federal sources. So that would include both direct and pass-through funded. The higher the percentage of our dollars that comes from federal sources, the more interested I am in indirect cost rates. If it's a tiny percentage, now I'm counting both what comes through pass-through and what comes from direct federal funding, then um, I'm less interested in indirect cost rates because they're so confusing to non-federal funders. 
I think it also depends on the structure of your entity, um, how easy or hard it would be to do this calculation and, and kind of how much horsepower you've got in your accounting department. Are you, do you have enough capacity to actually implement this consistently? It also depends on what your actual administrative costs are. If, if you really can get everything covered in the 10% de minimis rate, that might be pretty a pretty easy solution. So you've got to consider these factors. Let me get rid of that spotlight. And um, now I did some charts about com comparing the pros and cons of each of these methods. Um, so the cost allocation plan method, the direct charging method, um, don't have to have any direct federal funds. There's no limit on uh, provided in this method. Now, remember that some of your federal funding sources do have limits on administrative costs. So there's nothing we've said here that can overcome a statutory limit on administrative cost. But if there aren't those statutory limits, there, there isn't a limit and you can just allocate whatever you have. You don't need pre-approval. And it, this is pretty acceptable to non-federal uh, funders, including foundations, they're used to this. So it has that advantage. I guess I think the biggest con to this method is that if you've got monitors coming from different pass-through entities or coming from the federal entities themselves, they interpret these the rules for cost allocation differently. And I feel like you just open yourself to an endless stream of arguments about whether your methodology is acceptable. And where it really gets hairy is arguing about allocating administrative costs, where we just have a lot of differences of opinion about what is an allowable method. So a big con to me is, you know, we choose cost allocation plan, direct charging, we sign up for some arguments that, and they're so frustrating because I've had people tell me, you know, we've had this federal source uh, coming through our state agency. We've had it for 15 years and we've been monitored constantly and we've never had a monitoring pro problem. And now I get a new monitor and they say that my method is not an allowable method. So that is a really frustrating possibility. Um, the other thing is if you are, an agency that goes through a lot of rapid expansions and contractions, you're going to be busy adapting your cost allocation plan. And it can be more time consuming and it can produce less predictable results. And you know, when people are writing foundation grants, they often will come to you and say, well, well what's our indirect rate? And you say, well, we don't use an indirect cost rate. Well, what should I put in here to ask for the funder to uh, contribute to our administration? administrative and other common costs. And then we're into this long discussion. So it, it's, it's cumbersome is what I would say. Now, a federally negotiated indirect rate, it definitely has some pros. Uh, it has to be accepted by all federal agencies, has to be accepted by all pass-through entities. You get to choose the method you think works best really streamlines preparing budget proposals. Um, just really easy to say we're using our rate. Cons, well, you aren't gonna get one unless you have a direct federal award. Um, now that I should correct this slide, that is an error. It no longer precludes using the 10%. I thought I had corrected it. In fact, um, now you can drop your federal rate and just go for the 10% if you want to. It does require negotiation. It's often not acceptable to non-federal sources. Um, Pass-through rates, uh, now that the revisions are here, everybody's got to accept a negotiated pass-through rate. You choose the method, streamlines the budget process, um, but you got to find a project, a uh, pass-through entity to negotiate with you. And you may find that the pass-through entity is not very familiar with negotiating rates. And so it may be a difficult negotiation at first and it may not be acceptable to your non-federal sources. And then the de minimis rate, well, uh, it has to be accepted by all federal sources. No negotiation, definitely streamlines your budget preparation. The big con is you may not recover all your administrative costs and you may have been using it improperly because you didn't understand the modified total direct cost rules. And um, 
auditors and funders can still have a bone to pick with you, an argument about, did you put everything into that indirect category that you should have? Or are you trying to do what they would call double dip, which would mean charge the 10% and then put some costs that they think should be in the indirect category into the direct category. Now, um, we did it, we made it through all of the formal slides. Um, and before I say a few words about next steps, I just want you to see that um, in the back of the packet, at the end of the packet, there's a bunch of other resources about how to create cost allocation formulas, sort of how to do cost allocation. But the one I really wanted to call out is there's a very useful free budget, down, budget template that you can download. And, you know, think of all the work that we've been talking about, setting up these cost objectives, getting the direct cost properly assigned to the different cost objectives, dealing with the fact that we have some awards that start in the middle of the year and others that carry on after the end of the fiscal year, um, dealing with the fact that sometimes we have to try out um, different ways of defining indirect costs. Um, so this template gives you, it's, you know, linked spreadsheets is what it is. Um, it, it makes it so easy to try out different models. Now, you may have somebody on your staff who's like a spreadsheet genius, and they, they're so far ahead of this template, they've already got it completely down. But for a lot of us, yeah, we found a way to do it, but it's kind of cumbersome. And this template can really help. So I just, I just urge you to take a look at it. And then you'll see that what else is in here is links to all these different federal sources and places where you can find out more information. And then there's a series of slides about different cost allocation problems. But I want to come back to this final slide and say, you know, you made it through this uh, sort of strange topic. And um, I guess what I hope you will do is really think for a moment about how you define cost objective. And the, the commercial message I have here is if you have always done it grant by grant and said our objective is each award, you might want to try out a different method by saying it's a program and we have multiple awards funding the same program. And the reason why that can be helpful is that some of the funds that are helping you with a program, particularly if they're private funds or foundation funds, they're not gonna cover an indirect cost rate. But by defining the program as the cost objective, you can demonstrate that you have covered the requirements. So it, it's worth thinking about it. I hope you've been encouraged to evaluate your approach. Um, maybe think about an indirect rate if it, if it appeals to you. Uh, maybe think about giving up your indirect rate and going back to cost allocation if it doesn't appeal to you. I hope you'll check out your 10% de minimis uh, use to be sure that you're following the rules and um, you know that you'll consider which would really work best for you. And um, so with that, I know we're out of time, but I'm open to other questions that I didn't cover. And we made this offer last time, but I'll make it again that you are free to email me with questions if there are things that after you think about it and look at some of those charts again, you have questions, just send me an email and I'm happy to chat a little bit about it. So Diane and Michelle, do we have any more questions that we should answer or did we do it? Oh, there's more, yes. there's eight new messages there. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Christine, did you say that the, that the link that I put in there doesn't work? Is that what you're saying? I, um, I think the links in the slides do work, but I wonder, I, you can't look at them on a PDF. You ha I think you have to look at them in PowerPoint.